Greetings, everyone. This is Ted Kroll. This month, our Beyond the Bay Chats spotlight two of the finest movie musicals, Singing in the Rain and The Bandwagon. Although I was familiar with both of them, this was the first time I saw them close together and a light bulb went into my head. They are a match set. They both came out of Arthur Freed's unit at MGM in the early 1950s, and both have maintained a growing reputation over the years, especially singing in the rain. Here is a short discussion about the close similarities of these two films, as well as those qualities that separate them. As I explored the subject, I realized that a good-sized book or documentary could be made based on all the possibilities presented by these two films. Here are a few. Both films are technicolor extravaganzas. When these films were digitized, the vivid colors were restored that make the, both these pictures so enjoyable to watch. Both films make use of the entire technicolor palette. By the same token, the musical scores use fat, full orchestral sound. I'm not able to capture the sounds on this video, but the musical scoring in both in the song and background music share the lush instrumental arrangements. Also in both films, most of the musical numbers come from movie musicals filmed at MGM in the early 1930s. For example, the song Singing in the Rain was actually written in the 1920s. The exception is That's Entertainment, which was supposedly composed in 45 minutes for the bandwagon. Some of the same visual motifs appear in both films. Here a trio dances straight towards the camera. And in both, Sid Charisse holds the identical pose stretching out her long legs. This image was central to the publicity material of the bandwagon. Near the end of both films are extended dance numbers that have no connection to the plot of the film but presents Sid Charisse as a dark, central, femme fatale character who is almost identic, physically identical in both films. Also, the story in both pictures are quite similar. Both have romance involved, but more to the point, the narrative in both is driven by the efforts to make a success of a failed project. Here's where the films divert a bit. Singing in the Rain is about the change of Hollywood in, from the so-called silent era into the talkies. So the film is set in Los Angeles and Hollywood studio factories. In contrast, the bandwagon is about converting a failed pretentious Hodway show into an old-time musical review. Singing in the Rain is brash Hollywood versus cosmopolitan New York. You could say the thrust of Singing in the Rain is looking forward whereas the bandwagon is looking toward the past. Both of these films came out of the Arthur Freed unit of MGM. Arthur Freed was a New York songwriter who came to Hollywood during the period of time depicted in Singing in the Rain. Gradually, he rose in the ranks to create his own semi-independent production unit at MGM that produced an incredible set of musicals, Meet Me in St. Louis, American in Paris, Gigi, and many more. This photo of him was taken by Man Ray, a high art surrealist. Freed was a art collector, which seemed to have influenced some of the set designs. In Singing in the Rain, this set could come out of a dolly painting. Here in the, do in the bandwagon, the red fire escape looks like it'd be some sort of mid-century modernist sculpture. The wise cracking dialogue in both comes from the writing team of Betty Compton and Adolph Green. They wrote several musicals on Broadway and were brought out to Hollywood to work with the Arthur Freed unit. Partly what sets these films apart is due to their directors. Singing in the Rain was directed, co-directed by Gene Kelly and Stanley Dunnan. They both come into show business dancers. While Kelly had been around for a while, Dunnan was only 28 at the time. The fact that they were dancers and relatively youthful shows in the energy and exuberance 
in, in this picture. The bandwagon was directed by the old hand Vincent Minnelli, who was in the middle of his career. He came out of Broadway as a set designer. This Broadway background and the fact that he was in his 50s added a more somber as well as more sophisticated tone to the bandwagon. Of course, central to both films is, are the personalities and talents of their two stars, Gene Kelly and Fred Astaire. Kelly was at his peak, and Astaire was settling into the last period of his dancing career. While both are the finest dancers of their times, they had different styles. Here is the more athletic style of Kelly. I turn the sound off in order to focus on his movement. Here is a stare with Shid Therese, who is more smooth and debonair in his dancing. Over the years, Singing in the Rain has grown in its reputation more than the bandwagon. I think among other reasons, the casting has something to do with this. The sidekick in Singing in the Rain is Donald O'Connor, who is all manic energy and always a quick wisecrack. In the bandwagon, the male sidekick is Oscar Levant, who is dour, cynical, depressive character in the movie as well as in real life, who has seen it all. Perhaps more importantly are the female leads. Debbie Reynolds is bouncy, somewhat innocent on the way up showgirl with a fresh face. Whereas Sid Charisse is a dark, sensuous, sophisticated ballet dancer with a more reserved persona. As I was putting this piece together, I became aware of a connection between the two films that is probably not intentional, but is intriguing nevertheless. Set in the 1920s, Singing in the Rain ends with the main character, Don Lockwood, looking forward to a bright career with his new leading lady. The, the bandwagon, set in 1953, some 25 years later after Singing in the Rain, it opens with the main character, Tony Hunter, as presented as a man who is an old-timer, a has-been, years after his success. In some ways, this makes... The bandwagon, something of a sequel to Singing in the Rain, and accounts why, e why even though both films are quite similar, Singing in the Rain exudes youthful optimism, whereas the bandwagon has an underlying tone of mature melancholy. Still, both are brilliant works of art, and, on, and while watching them, one can simply sit back and agree with the reprise of the song at the end of the bandwagon, that's entertainment. Please join us for a discussion of the bandwagon Tuesday, January 26th, 7.30 p.m. on YouTube, the Bay Theater Channel.